Those uncomfortable things we do for beauty. Oof, ouch. And when it comes to whiter teeth, same story. Until now. Enjoy wince-free whitening with new Sensodyne Clinical White. You'll get clinically proven whitening technology in an enamel-safe formula. For two shades whiter teeth and 24-7 sensitivity protection. <sighs> Sensodyne Clinical White. A whiter smile without the wince. This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, theoretical physicist Leonard Mladenow explores advances in the study of emotion in psychology and neuroscience, which suggest that the power of feelings is equally as important to our success as thinking. Emotions play a important, vital role, I argue, uh, in, in your everyday life, even in, not maybe always moment to moment, unless you're talking about core affect, but but emotional uh, emotional experiences happen much more often probably than people think about. It's not just when you get really angry at that driver who cut you off. that you're, That's not the only time in the day that you're feeling emotion. He's interviewed by Northeastern University professor and author Lisa Feldman Barrett. More after this. Hey, Len. It's so great to see you. I've been so looking forward to this conversation. Hey, Lisa. It's great to see you, too. How are you? Uh, how are you faring in the pandemic? Uh, knock on wood, everything has been uh, been okay. Uh, yep, we're just looking forward to it all ending if it ever does. <laughs> I hear you. What's um? So congratulations on the release of your book. I'm curious what your experience has been with um, trying to uh, get the word out about your book during a pandemic. <laughs> well, they held the book for. I'd say not, about six extra months, uh, I think, thinking that, that everything would be over. And then, it, of course, there was a lull in it, and then it came back. Right. Before- the most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room... It matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton, for the stay. Before the book came out, um, it's kind of interesting. I've had about 30 events that I'm doing uh, in re- with regard to the launch where normally I'd be going from city to city. And here, I'm just in this beautiful spot <laughs> uh, for all of them. And um, I, I miss... I miss some of it. I would, I would, I, if I was traveling around, you and I could be sitting together now, Lisa. <laughs> I know exactly, exactly. Yeah, that was my experience when I released my book too, which was, you know, some somewhat like in the middle of the pandemic. It was, it had its own, you know, um, it had some advantages, but it was also, you know, much less um, celebratory than I than yeah. I would have imagined. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, I thought we could start with. Um, kind of a general question. You're a physicist and your your initial training is as a scientist. Um, but at some point, you started to write uh, books for the public, nonfiction books, particularly about science. And I'm wondering what that process was like for you. Well, I, I've always uh, been passionate about writing. I started writing short stories in third grade and, and our school librarian would read them and, you know, tell me, encourage me, tell them, oh, this is great. <laughs> They're about dinosaurs or whatever. And so I've always enjoyed, I used to write short stories through college and graduate school. And so at, at some point when I uh, became a physicist, I decided to you know, keep up my writing and eventually started writing for Hollywood. So I left physics for a while in, in the 1980s and I wrote for many Hollywood shows, of course, some that you might predict, Star Trek, The Next Generation, and MacGyver. No, seriously? You wrote for Star Trek? I did. I was on, I was uh, a story editor on the writing staff for this whole second season. Yeah. Wow. I, I actually didn't know that. I'm now, I'm more impressed than I was before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm impressed with you too, Lisa. So, <laughs> But I did that and um, did that for a while. Then I went into computer games all the while. I kept since I'm a theoretical physicist, I, I can do that on the side. So I've continued to do physics as a hobby. And eventually I went back to Caltech on the faculty and started writing books. Uh, I uh, decided that to express both my 
science interest and my writing interest. And of course, I started writing popular science books. And my first one was about the geometry of curved space. <laughs> A surefire hit, right? <laughs> <laughs> And eventually, I, I have a friend, uh, Christoph Koch, who I'm sure you know, who's an eminent neuroscientist, and he studies consciousness. So I got interested about 15 years ago in, in, in that through his work. And he encouraged me not to look at consciousness, but to look at the unconscious mind. Uh, he said, we, we have a much better handle on that than we do on consciousness. And he invited me into his lab, and I spent several years in his lab, attending all their seminars and going to... Take, taking courses and reading hundreds of papers and just kind of cramming and learning about the mind, the neuroscience. And eventually I wrote a book called Subliminal about the unconscious mind and how it affects our behavior, uh, obviously without our knowing it. So all the hidden, hidden influences that we have. And that was fun. I learned a lot about myself. I, I felt I, 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 I grew as a person and I think that my readers also uh, appreciated it. It, it was uh, it made, it became a bestseller, and so uh, I wrote another one. And now this is my third my third book. And in this book, emotional, I'm also trying to help people understand themselves and what, what where they're thinking, their feelings, uh, their behavior comes from, and in, in from parts of their brain that they maybe don't often think about. Yes, yeah, so you just answered my second question, which was how you went from one super complicated thing, you know, quantum mechanics to another incredibly complicated thing, which is the nature of the human brain and the human mind. Um, and we could we could arm wrestle over which one is more complicated. Um, well, I, but, I, I uh, think yours is more complicated. So unless you think mine is, uh, you win. Oh, so, well... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I have illusions of understanding something about the mind, whereas I completely, I mean, until recently, I think partly through conversations with you and also through some very selected reading, have a vague notion, a vague notion, maybe like the most vague notion of what um, what quantum mechanics is all about in a heuristic way. Um, but one of the things... I wanted to say was that um, one of the things I love about about your writing um, is that you, the stories that you, you're a wonderful storyteller, and the stories that you animate your books with are really fun and humorous, and um, and some of them are very poignant. Um, like in this book, there were there were one or two stories that brought me to tears almost. Um, and I, I'm wondering um, how you choose the stories that will illustrate the points that you want to make. That's my first question. And in particular, in this book, you know, you're telling some very personal stories and what that, what that felt like writing about it. Well, when I approach each chapter, I first figure out what you know, what I want to say, what points I want to get across in the chapter, and and then I, I look for uh, ways to get it across that are as far away from a textbook as possible. I like to illustrate points with stories, and to me, it's exciting to find that great story that 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 makes my point uh, dramatic or humorous or whatever the uh, qualities it has that are, that make it interesting. And that's part of the fun of, of the writing for me. I, you know, since I grew up writing short stories and then wrote for television, I've always been interested in drama and, and in, you know, in humor. I actually wrote for uh, Night Court. Remember that old show? <laughs> and yeah. I, I did an episode of the old that's Gary funny. Shandling show, the original one. And uh, oh I did a, some, a few sitcoms. Yeah, I used to be funny when I was younger. <laughs> no, you're but, still funny. You're still funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I try to find, if I can, a humorous or whatever it is, because I think that uh, people buy my books for that because they buy them to be engaging as well as informative. And I find that that would, that's really my, uh, I think my niche in science writing. Uh, there are plenty of uh, researchers writing books and writing often about their own research and about their own field. But <laughs> I don't know of any other one who wrote for Night Court or Star Trek. So 
So I think that that's what I can bring to it. And, and that's what excites me. I, I'm, part, part of what excites me, of course, is digesting the subject that I'm going to write about and learning about it and getting all the insights that, that I can, can glean from it and sharing that. But the other side of it is it's, it's, just, uh, it's just fun to start trolling around uh, looking for, uh, for foraging, I should say, I guess, looking for the right, for the right stories and whether I find them through the internet or some obscure books or something, at least in the old days that was in the library, a uh, out of print book from 1956. that has a story of some researcher or something. It's, mm-hmm. it's fun. It's fun when you find that golden story and I enjoy, uh, working out how to tell the story and uh, make it humorous or dramatic or to, to you know, to tell it in a way that I, where I don't uh, screw it up, where I really let it, really let it sing and, and, and have its dramatic or humorous impact. Oh, and you asked me at the second part two was uh, about this book. Uh, th- there were, well, in most of my books, there are some, deeply personal and emotional stories. Uh, yeah, there emotional. are. And there are. And this is the third book of your, well, four, fourth book, I think, of yours that I've read. But I, or maybe it's just that these particular stories grabbed me in a way that, I mean, all, all every book I've read of yours has, has this really person, has a personal narrative sort of flowing through it, which I find really compelling um, particularly in, you know, like a, fam- it's like a familiar, like familiar essays, you know, they're, you're writing about something, you know, that, you know, um, partially from a, a scientific or historical perspective, but then there's also this kind of personal narrative woven in which is really lovely. But I just found a couple of the stories in this. I, I found them particularly poignant, like grabbed me in a way mm. and tugged, uh, you know, in a way I think then that was, really compelling, like just really compelling. Yeah. And I, I, I shed some tears writing it too. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. try not to do that yeah. now, but um, you know, I was blessed or cursed. <laughs> uh, well, I shouldn't be, make it be about me, but by having uh, two parents who survived the Holocaust yeah. and uh, they went through uh, quite extreme experiences uh, they reacted quite differently to their experiences, but they both yeah. lost families. They lost their friends. My mother lost her, um, her father and her sister who she was very close to and, and all her friends. And my dad lost his, I think it was four siblings and his wife and child. And um, he was in the resistance and then in a concentration camp. And, you know, I grew up with this as, as my background, but also in a house where I think the emotional life was a bit, different than, than most people uh, and, and different in different ways. And my mother reacted one way to her experiences. My father kind of in the opposite, opposite way. My mother was a pessimist and always worried that uh, she's going to lose everything tomorrow, you know, without notice. And my father was a fighter and an optimist. And, um, but it was a very intense uh, uh period growing up that they were very loving and very encouraging. Oh, and I, I felt I had a good childhood, but it was a emotionally uh, uh, unusual circumstances. And so I, there was a lot of fodder for my books coming from their lives or our interactions. Uh, and that appears in, in many, if not most of my books, different stories from, from that. But of course, in this book being on, on emotions, uh, the, the, uh, the past, uh, the the very unusual emotional past that I experienced uh, was directly relevant, and so there are some some you know stories relating to that in in the book that I think are for me were very um, dramatic and even difficult to write about. But I guess I see that as a writer that you know, if I can't bring opening myself and my own um, life or feelings. To, into you know if i can't expose that then i then i'm not much of a writer and and uh and i wouldn't have anything to write about either 
Oh, it's such a clutch pickup, Dave. I was worried we'd bring back the same team. I meant those blackout motorized shades. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. I installed these and then got some for my mom, too. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Hall of Fame son? They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Blinds.com is the GOAT. The GOAT. Go to Blinds.com for up to 45% off. Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. At Mayo Clinic in Florida, we're conquering the unconquerable. Using artificial intelligence and data, our experts can create a personalized gene roadmap just for you, customizing your cancer treatment, giving your body exactly what it needs to fight the disease. We're making more possible at Mayo Clinic because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic, you know where to go. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, uh, what I would say is, I mean, I think, um, I think a lot of writers include personal material, but there's personal material and then there's really personal material, you know? And so it's really brave of you to write about something that's so raw in some ways. Um, uh, and to do it, but to do it in a way that, um, really reels the reader in quickly, I think. Um, I, I, uh, I found that really impressive, particularly because when I was writing my book also about emotion, but a number of years ago, and I, I started actually with a, something about the Holocaust. That was the opening example. And in the end, I ended up changing it to something that I thought was similarly gripping, but was probably more proximal for people, which Mm -hmm. was the Sandy Hook, um, um, you know, situation, which was so tragic um, because it was more recent. And I thought people could, could, um, could kind of grab onto it more. But I think, you know, writing about a narrative, about a story that is for you, that's personal and yet inviting people in to share that pain in a popular science book is a, is a pretty unique thing actually, and makes the book, um, I think, um, part of what makes the book kind of a, 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 a real adventure to read because you're, it, there, there's a sort of an undercurrent of narrative there that's not just, oh, look how things work. You know, it's like, look how things work and I'm going to apply that and demonstrate it to you in this. Uh, it's kind of a show, don't tell um, strategy, which I think, you know, readers really appreciate. I know this reader really appreciated it. Um, what do you think is harder, writing about some a science that you know or or writing about one that you're learning about <laughs> well i'll tell you learning writing about something i'm learning about is more fun yeah for you sure have, <laughs> yeah yeah um and i don't know if one is more difficult than the other even when i'm writing about writing physics books there's so much i have to learn or figure out to to put it in it because if, if i was just writing a textbook then that would be easy i could just do it from my knowledge base. Mm-hmm. But since my books involve historical elements, story elements, um, uh, relations to, to people's lives and thinking, uh, there's, there's a lot of research that goes into my books, even when they're uh, physics books, like mm-hmm. take the grand design that I wrote with Stephen Hawking. Uh, it, it's about uh, the origin of the universe. Um, and the idea that the universe could have come from nothing and where the laws came from and these big, deep questions. But, you know, there's, there's anecdotes about uh, ancient uh, history or popes, a pope from the, I think, 16th century. There, there's stories of, 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 uh, from mythology. Uh, there's there, there's uh, passages about Richard Feynman, a, a great physicist, and in his life, and there's so much in it that's not pure physics, uh, and all that had to be found out and 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 researched and um, put into a compelling uh, form. So there's plenty that I don't know, even when I'm doing a a, a physics a physics book. And I think at the beginning I, I may have had more fun doing physics books, but now that I've written uh, so many physics or math related books. I think it's uh, more fun for me now to do the neuroscience psychology books. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, but you asked easier. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I would say they're, they're equally hard. As you know, having written uh, at least two books yourself, uh, two popular science books, yeah, it's not easy, <laughs> even when you know your subject, right, Lisa? <laughs> no, it's harder. For me, actually, that, that kind of writing is, is actually harder than academic writing. You know, writing for, you know, inward facing science writing is, is a little bit easier. Although I will say that I think my science writing has improved dramatically <laughs> um, because I'm holding myself to a higher standard of explanation than I, I am with not relying on jargon. It's a really good, you know, crutch to have, but you can't, you can't rely on that crutch when you're talking to, um, civilians, as we call them in my lab, which are, you know, the public non-scientists. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally. Uh, when you, when I write a, a physics paper, I don't have to worry about entertaining or making it compelling. Well, I mean, I hope it's compelling, but I hope the ideas make it compelling. It's not the writing. And I just try to write it clearly. But when I write for a popular audience, writing it clearly is not enough, right? They, they have, people have to enjoy, they have to want to read it they want you want them to have to want more you, you you have to really connect with your audience that in a way that you don't have to when you're writing an academic paper that's true and your 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 voice has to come through like one of the things i really love about um about reading your books especially this book is that um i felt like i could you know hear you i mean i felt like i had a sense of your voice which doesn't always come through. It certainly doesn't come through. And you don't even want it to come through in your scientific papers. But I think often in, in popular science writing, it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily come through. And I don't think I ha- I don't think a reader has to know you to, to get that feeling. Um, um, I'm wondering what led you to write about emotion and what's the big message of the book? Because there are, you know, there are a lot of books that have been published over the last decade about emotion, and they're not always in agreement with each other because it's a very tumultuous field. It's like there's a lot of drama, right, going on. Um, And um, so how did you come to the conclusion that this was what you were, (laughs) the next thing that you're going to take on? And... um, What's the main, me- what's the big message that distinguishes your book from some of these other books? <clears throat> Excuse me. I was attracted to this uh, topic of emotion in a similar way, as I mentioned before, that, that, the, what, that was the attraction for the unconscious mind. I felt that a lot of our thoughts, behavior, ideas, decisions were highly influenced by emotion in a way that we didn't think about or realize, or in fact, in a way that we misunderstood because people uh, generally say, or in our popular culture and over the centuries have said that emotion is something to be avoided, uh, so to be controlled, uh, something that gets in the way of good thinking and that um, makes us do things we shouldn't be doing, (laughs) things like that. And I I was thinking, well, actually, that's not the case. And uh, so it would be interesting to write a book about what emotion is and how it does affect our thinking and decision making in a in a positive way and what its purpose was. And so I, I talked to a friend of mine, another eminent Caltech neuroscientist, a friend of yours too, Ralph Adolphs, who does emotions research. And I and we 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 regularly go out for uh, very spicy Sichuan food. And at one of our dinners, I said, "Hey, I'm thinking of writing a book about emotion." And he goes, oh, no, no, no. And then he says what you just said. <laughs> and it's a, a tumultuous field. It's been re- being revolutionized. It's uh, crazy. And, and I, I, as I learned later, it's also a field that's just exploding. And, and he said, stay away from that. That'll be, that'll be a tough one. And I go, perfect. No, it's drama. It's tumult. <laughs> that's what I want. That's what else is more interesting to write about. So instead of talking me out of it, he talked me into it. <laughs> And he was a big help, I have to say, in guiding me and um, as I was learning about it and writing about it and reading my chapters and giving me his advice and his opinion. Mm-hmm. So so I that's um, how I got into into that. I think there was a part two of your question, but I, maybe the coughing dispelled that. Yeah, it, it flew out of my brain, but you could remind me if I you was remember just, it. I was just wondering what... Um, what y- 
what's the big what's your big message in this book and is it consistent with the other books that have been published or or oh, is right. it is it well just, I, is there I, something distinctive Mm-hmm. I've read a not, I haven't read a lot of them. I read, of course, yours, which I enjoyed, <laughs> and uh, you, and you do write well. And I read uh, Antonio uh, Damasio's book, and I, I'm not sure I read. I read other more academic books. Uh, what yeah, I tried to do uh, was not to take one particular uh, approach or another, but to look at them all and try to make sense of them together. I think I, some of my book is certainly based on, on your work, whether you. <laughs> Uh, no, I could would see have written that, it actually. quite that way or not. So, yeah, sorry. I could, no, I could, I could see. I, I, in fact, I quote women, you, I think. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. And it was, it was nice of you to do that. I think, you know, I think sometimes people who are, you know, when you're looking at science from the outside, it, you think that, or at least maybe this is what I used to think um, before I became a practicing scientist, that, um that scientists, science is this slow accumulation of knowledge and build towards some like fundamental understanding. And I suppose it is that in, in some way, um, but it's not a linear way. And there's usually a lot of debate. And oftentimes it's really at the, in the fire of debate, you know, in, uh, that um, discoveries are, are made. And so disagreement and debate is, is really part of the process of science. It doesn't mean that something's wrong. Even if it's uncomfortable, it doesn't mean that something's wrong. It means that there's a big opportunity and people are really hot on the trail of things. And, um, uh, and that eventually, you know, over time with careful observation and discussion and sometimes disagreement um, that, um, you know, you, you move towards an under, a better understanding. And one of the things that, you know, I, even though we don't agree on everything, one thing I think I can say is I think that the, that your treatment of the, the various points of view, you treated them lightly and you were very, very, you were, it was interesting to, for me to see how you negotiated that territory. I, I thought it was really so not just as a reader, but also as a scientist who studies the topic, I thought it was really interesting to see how you navigated that landscape. And I was curious, um, you know, to know what you think the, if you were going to boil it down to like one message, what is that mess? What's the message of your book? And you said it, you said emotions aren't you know, they're not, um, they can be sources of wisdom. They're not uh, always um, sources of mischief or, or, or worse. Right. And, and, and in fact, I would go farther and say that they, on the, the great majority of times, uh, they are very helpful and useful. And, and obviously they, they're there for a reason. They evolve for a reason. There are times where they get out of control or perhaps the persistence of an emotion beyond the incident that triggered it uh, causes problems in, in, in later in the day or something like that. Um, but, you know, your eyes have suffered from optical illusions and you see mirages and you don't say <laughs> eyes are bad. We want to, we want to be able to see. And the same is, is true of emotions. Um, emotions play a important vital role. I argue uh, in, in your everyday life, even in, not maybe always moment to moment, unless you're talking about core affect, but but emotional uh, emotional experiences happen much more often probably than people think about. It's not just when you get really angry at that driver who cut you off that you're. That's not the only time in the day that you're feeling emotion. You're you're feeling it in much more subtle and everyday uh, normal situations and, and, and all through the day. And they, they and the emotions are what prompt you to do much, take much, many of your actions. If you had no feelings at all, if you were just a robot with no feelings, when I was on Star Trek, the next generation, that was what data was supposed to be. At least Spock was half human, but data was purely, uh, un, you know, unemotional. Uh, what, what, what would cause you to even do anything? You, you wouldn't, you have no desire, no goals, no enjoyment, no joy. So why would you get up off your chair? You know, unless your program specifically said at nine o'clock, get up and go make coffee or whatever it is that, you know, our current robots do, but it would never initiate action on its own other than what was programmed 
into it. So I argue that I talk about how that works and, and how emotion is, is, is really vital. But let me say one other thing, and I know that you, you'll agree, I, I believe you'll agree with this, and it's an important part. I want to make clear that I talk about the emotional, uh, emotion and rational thinking. Uh, and I don't mean by, I, I, I say that these are inextricable, that they are, not only is emotion not counterproductive, but there's no such thing as a purely logical, rational processing in your brain that it all happens together and it works together. And I talk about how, how that happens. But when I say rational brain, I don't mean there's a, there's a part of your brain there that that's, this is rational. This part of your brain is emotional and, and they're literally uh, working together or fighting whatever they're doing. Uh, the, the brain is doing what it's doing and it's a combination of processes And in order to make sense of it and talk about it, we talk about rationality separately from emotion, but it happens together. And and so it's important to keep to keep that in mind. And I think that older theories and older visions of emotion were that were, were, were not that were that there was a rational parts of your brain. There's emotional, there's structures that that are govern the emotions and that there's a center, let's say, of fear they used to call it, say, the amygdala, I think, in the 90s was the fear organ. And, and we know some that that's still think not it's, true some now. People, it's, some people still think it's the fear organ, my friend. So, um, some, so I hope oh, uh, you mean our listeners in, oh. are listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's not even one organ. I mean, there's. It, 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 it's even exactly. how you delineate it. I mean, why you call yeah. it the amygdala. But, we you know, I've raised reading about, I think there were 12 or 20 sub organs are talking about within the amygdala. So, it's hard in the brain even to to, to delineate a, a structures and to uh, determine or decide what what are distinct structures, isn't? Don't wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, first of all, brains don't come color coded, <laughs> and when you're looking at when you're looking at a brain, it's really really hard to um, see demarcations of structures and sometimes things that look like a single structure actually aren't. So like the amygdala, I think is a really good example. It's a collection of nuclei, which are just clumps of cells. And um, when you peer into those cells and you look at the molecular genetics, the, you know, uh, the cells, what you can see is that some of them are very old and they have very old lineage and some of them have a newer lineage, which doesn't mean that they are new tissue. It's just that they, um, they, uh, they grow in a different way than, than, than they used to. And actually this is true of many, many structures in the brain. Um, so some structures that we think of as, or that people uh, sometimes write about as being very ancient, like this part called the hypothalamus, which is right in the center of the brain. And it's important for regulating the body. There's a very ancient part that, that you can trace all the way back to Amphioxus like 500 million years ago or 400 million years ago. And then there's a newer part that emerged with vertebrates, but it just looks like one structure. So, you know, your eyes alone don't really tell you much about the structure or the function of any brain, frankly. Um, And I thought you did a really nice job of talking about that. Um, when you took on the the myth of the you know reptilian brain and the limbic system and and so on, which goes by the the name the the triune brain, I thought that was that was really fun to read. Oh well, well, thank you. That, that was an amazing model. That in that, I mean, you still seem to sometimes you find papers where people still seem to to follow that. I mean, hopefully, it's mainly use it as a convenient shorthand when they talk about the limbic system or, you know, your reptilian brain. But for the viewers who don't know what that is, there's a, it's the idea that the brain developed in layers and the, the most fundamental was the reptilian layer. And that's obviously uh, the, uh, the, it con- controls your basic bodily functions. Uh, you need a brain for that. And then built on that, mammals have emotion. And that's, so that's the limbic brain. And built on top of that, humans and I guess primates have, have the uh, neocortex, which is, I guess, the logical, rational, conscious kind of thinking. And that, and the, the idea that evolution, first of all, it just doesn't work that way. And we, not just in the brain, if you look all over your body, you can see that it's not that 
uh, new layers are added. Things are incorporated when, 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 the, when, when evolution makes an advance. It's in, it's taking what's there and incorporating it into something else. It's not just adding another layer onto it. And th- these different layers have all kinds of interconnections, and they all—it's just not really a a, a very uh, accurate model. I, I think of it as like the Greek idea of atoms. Uh, it was an interesting concept, and it gave us some words that were that are useful to use sometimes. Atom, but it's nothing like the current understanding of what an atom is. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, but that was very yeah, tied were- to, yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Oh, I was saying that was very tied uh, to to Dar- Darwin's theory of emotion. So I thought it was it was important to to bring up because I think that Darwin's theory of emotion was first of all the most the first big scientific investigation of emotion, but also the basis of uh, what most people how most people view emotion, and 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 wrong in almost all its <laughs> almost yeah. All its so I was I was gonna <laughs> say that um, that you. Uh... You know, you challenge Darwin's views of emotion, which is a really brave thing to do to take on, you know, a, a heroic figure of 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 mythical <laughs> proportions. Um, and not to I'm not to diminish Darwin's importance in biology or any of his important um, um, innovations in biology, but the work that he did on emotion is somehow very undarwinian actually and he he sort of violates some of the basic uh innovations that he introduces in on the origin of species i i thought it was very brave of you to um to do that what made you decide to 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 take on that particular um narrative well what when when i was studying the field and, and seeing what people such as you and, um, and Ralph Adolph, David Anderson and other, other emotion researchers were discovering and writing about it was, it was there. I'm not, they don't always, or they don't usually, or maybe almost never start their paper by saying, here's what Darwin said and he's wrong, but it was clearly, I do, but that's, you yeah, do, you I do, do, but you but do. <laughs> and I, and I noted that and I thought, yeah, it's, uh, it's true. So I'm talking about all these things. And so it was, I felt it was good in a way as a foil to, to start by explaining what Darwin thought. And, and it is, I think the basis of what most people think it's kind of intuitive. It seems to be intuitively correct, just like Newton's laws seem to be intuitively correct. And physicists know that they're wrong, but they, they do have a, a their place. And it's a little different in physics because um, Newton's laws can be the, pretty well describe your macroscopic world, even though they're not the true fundamental laws. But Darwin's theory is somewhere between the, the Greek atomist idea and and Newton uh, in, in terms of how wrong he is. <laughs> but, but About emotion. You know, yeah, thought, about I, emotion. About yeah. emo- I mean, I'm sorry, about emotion. I better say that. Yeah, I mean, so Darwin mm-hmm. was one of the, you know, he, he was the most important figure in, in, in the history of biology. And you might compare him to Einstein, but in physics, but Einstein was wrong about many things. For example, he didn't, he was one of the founders, by the way, of quantum theory. I should say that first, but he didn't like quantum theory. And later in his mm-hmm. years, he opposed it, thought it was wrong. and would be superseded by something and that doesn't diminish our respect for Einstein or the value of what he did. It's just mm-hmm. that, look, science is not about the people. It's about the ideas and, and, and brilliant people have some good ideas and some bad ideas. And we all have bad ideas, actually, brilliant and not brilliant people. And we all have to evaluate our ideas. And even if a brilliant person has a bad idea that that brilliant person doesn't see as being bad, it doesn't diminish the good ideas that that same person had. And so let me say what Darwin's theory was just briefly. Um, That is that, so Darwin worked very hard to understand emotion. And of course, he wanted to understand it from the evolutionary point of view and see how it fit with his theory of evolution. And so he's asking the question, why do we have emotions? What purpose does it serve? And the same question for animals. And at, even, even in that, I have to say, he, that was a smart thing that he did because people, even today, uh, often debate whether or not animals have emotion. And I like the, <laughs> the stories I tell in my, 
in the book about David Anderson's work uh, with fruit fly emotion. So you know where I land on that. But uh, Darwin saw that, studied animals and looked at their expressions and, and came to the conclusion that emotions were useful for communication so that, that one animal could, let's say, warn uh, others of a, of a predator in a neighborhood or if they were in opposition to each other by looking fierce, that animal that 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 animal could say to the other one don't don't mess with me and maybe they'll avoid a fight in that way or the fear would cause the animal say to flee rather than to stand there and get eaten when a predator was there and and so he he looked at these uh uh functions of emotion and said okay what about humans but humans are different humans have language humans have logical rational processing and so darwin uh, concluded that that, the, that this role of emotion was outmoded in people. It's kind of like your appendix is outmoded in your in your digestive system. Right. That that we had outgrown. We have a better way. Mm-hmm. Sorry, it's a vestige. It's not useful. It's and a vestige. It's, not, it's, yeah. it's useless. Yeah, it's useless. So that's what that was one conclusion. Another conclusion was that there are uh, basic emotions. Uh, Fear, anger, uh, joy, sadness, disgust, and surprise that 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 they're, they're basic emotions that they that they're each one is unitary, meaning there's one kind of fear, there's one kind of disgust that they're separate that fear and 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 uh, disgust or other emotions have a sharp line between them uh, that they're universal uh, uh, if you go he he traveled to other um, i mean he he didn't he studied. Uh, how how people far away lands experience emotion and concluded that it was all universal. So in all these things that I've mentioned and and oh then there was also stuff that was added later about each emotion having its own seat in the brain, which I don't think uh, Darwin talked about, but it, it, it that was he added talked about to the, the nervous system generally. He didn't really talk about the brain specifically. He talked about you know the the he yeah he was talking about the nervous system in general, not about. Piece not, not the brain. Yeah. Well, all these things that he said turned out to be wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was exciting to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, because, well, what's not wrong is that they evolve for a reason and that they, they play these certain roles and, 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 and more than that, that we know, we now know, but the idea, let's say that, that uh, emotions are, are unitary, that there's one type of fear, one type of disgust and, and et cetera. That's, that's not true. The fear, in fact, with modern neuroscience, we can even look at what's going on in in your brain. And uh, one of the studies I love was one where they compared uh, uh, the uh, the, the fear of, uh, say, a scorpion crawling up your arm to the fear of suffocation. And uh, they actually could do this in the lab. (laughs) This was interesting in itself. But they had a a patient uh, that uh, had had no uh, bilateral amygdala damage, or I think maybe no amygdala w- w- congenitally. Uh, a- and she did not feel the, the uh, fear of uh, say the scorpion, but, but she did have f- fear of suffocation when they put her in an environment with low oxygen or high carbon dioxide. So, mm-hmm. so fear is not, there's not just fear. There's different kinds of fear. Uh, the, the line you talk about, uh, I, I think you talked about in your, in your uh, first book, uh, uh, is often blurred, or maybe it was in a paper that I read of yours, but the line between fear and anxiety is often blurred, right? And, and, and some people will call something anxiety, other people will call the same thing fear, and even in situations, it's sometimes hard to tell, because fear is something definite in your immediate environment, and, and anxiety is, is something indefinite, something potential, something in the future, and there are situations where you're not, it's hard to tell whether that the situation is there or not, right? And, and was that fear or anxiety? So the point is that, that these, these, you call them, these are categories, right? The, 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 the ter- we have to have some word to, to talk about different feelings, even approximate words or coarse graining, let's say. Like there may be 25 or an infinite number of different kinds of fear that maybe William James would have said. Um, but we, in order to talk about it, we, we categorize them into these categories. And so that's how it works, not the way Darwin mentioned it. And the universality of that is also called into question. It's not, they, don't, they don't seem to be the same in all cultures. It, that's something that's hard to test, I think, be, today because uh, there's such uh, 
globalization and communication that of course things get uh, cultures get mixed. But if you go to isolated tribes and you show them pictures and try and look at what their emotion categories are, what they recognize in the face, we find we find differences, right? And and in languages, we find that languages categorize emotions differently. Some uh, there's a language that I, I think had no um, no word for sadness that I talked about. Uh, there's one language that has a, a, an emotion term for the exhilaration you feel when you go headhunting. <laughs> Not something it's really useful Liggett, in our culture. Which is but... called Liggett. It's called Liggett. Liggett. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm having this out-of-body experience, though, as you're talking to me, because I'm thinking, you're describing to me the research of my lab, which went to Tanzania and, you know, we studied the Hadza hunter-gatherers and to the Himba in northwestern Nigeria. <laughs> That's and so, right, that was. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, I'm never going to be able to to return the favor and describe to you, <laughs> describe <laughs> your work to you in a way that will, because <laughs> I don't really understand theoretical physics. Um, but yes, of course. I mean, what, here's what I'll say though about Darwin, that, um, you know, Darwin didn't think that emotions evolved by natural selection. Right? So Darwin's great insight in biology was, um, there were a couple of really profound insights, one of which was evolution occurs by natural selection. That is, there's variation um, in a species and the um, some of those individuals with some features that vary, you know, will do better in some situations in some circumstances than in others. And those are the ones who are gonna reproduce more. And um, that will change, you know, the character of the species over time. But that's not the notion he used in, um, uh, he used, you know, a very different version of evolution uh, that came from Lamarck, which was an, the idea that um, once a characteristic is acquired, it's just passed down um, and uh, unchanged. And this is how he could get to this idea, right, that, um, that dogs and, and, uh, and flies and other animals um, can use emotional expressions for the purpose of communicating, but in humans, because we have language, you know, um, we still have those vestiges of our animal past, but, uh, but we don't use them anymore. Um, uh, and from Darwin's perspective, if he could show that, you know, emotional, that, that movements of the face and, and changes in the body were vestiges of an animal past, that would be evidence that humans uh, were subject to uh, evolution and that we shared as a species and that we shared an animal past with other animals, right? A common ancestor. And so it would be evidence in a sense for, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that was his goal. I don't know that his goal, I mean, who knows it was what his goal was. He's not here to say, right? But in my reading of that book, uh, the expression of the emotion in man animals, it, it seemed to me like he was, wasn't so much interested in emotion and the nature of emotion, but uh, in creating evidence for his views on, Perfect. yeah, yeah, that humans were, um, you know, human, that we are a species that is subject to the laws of evolution in, in, um, in the same way as, as other animals. Um, still, I think it's, um, you still see a lot of popular science books and a lot of articles and even scientific articles starting um, with the claim that Darwin, um, uh, you know, thought that emotional expressions were functional in humans. And um, which just leads me to think that, um, you know, people should probably go back and read that book. But I was really, I found it really refreshing that you're, book didn't do that. And I also thought it was a kind of brave thing to do to take Darwin on. Um, and Darwin really had this idea, right, as you write about, that um, he had this old idea of a mind at war with itself, right, that, mm -hmm. your, that your behavior is this constant struggle between um, cognition and emotion, between rationality and feeling, and thinking and feeling. And, you know, if rationality wins, your ethical and uh, healthy. And if emotion win or instincts win, then you're either, you know, sick, 
because you couldn't control yourself or you're immoral because you didn't try hard enough. And this idea of, um, you know, uh, thinking of uh, rationality as the um, crowning glory, if you will, of human evolution is really embedded in, in Darwin's view. And I liked how you explain that in your book. I thought that was really, that was really interesting. This is all about your book. And, and so I'm not going to tell you what I, you know, what my views are, which I think are, are pretty consistent with yours, but, but maybe different in some important ways. What I did want to um, ask you though, was, you know, you, you place a lot of emphasis, not a lot, but there's a section, a healthy section of emphasis on the regulation of emotion, on, ha- on handling emotion. And I'm, I'm wondering, was that your goal in writing the book to include the, that, those, you know, those um, topics related to the regulation of emotion? Or was that something that your editor suggested that you add? <laughs> and the reason why I'm asking is because when I wrote my book, you know, I felt like they were telling me you have to have an obligatory, you know, self-help section, <laughs> self-help chapter in your book. And it turned out that the sex, the, the couple of chapters that I wrote where I was trying to take the science and actually translate it into helpful tips and like skill building um, opportunities turn out to be like super important for people. Um, you know, and so I'm wondering what your, what, how did you enter that space? Like, was that your idea or did somebody tell you that's really what you needed to do? No, no, not, not at all. And um, as I was studying the field, I, I, I found that, 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 that there's a big literature on that. It's also part of the, the I think, the explosion in um, effective neuroscience that's happened in the last uh, couple of decades. So I, I felt that that was, as, to me, as a, as a as a, as a human and a person who's learning about this, I, I felt that was useful and important. And um, a lot of that is um, uh, it, uh, Jim Gross's work up at Stanford. And, and it, it, it was very useful to me. There were two chapters like that. I, there was one on the emotional profile where I, I talk about how there are individual differences in people and their propensity to experience or to feel certain emotions or to hang on to those emotions. Some people are, uh, have a tendency toward anger. Some people have less a tendency to not be angered and so forth, shame and guilt. And I was uh, surprised as I was uh, studying the literature that there were all these inventories or the really questionnaires, they call them inventories that psychologists had developed because as mm-hmm. scientists, they, you need to be able to measure and quantify things. And, and so people who are studying different emotions developed questionnaires uh, to to measure that is, is their subject feeling disgust? They want to induce disgust, let's say in the lab. Well, they need a, a some way of measuring that. Or if they're studying a disorder of anger, they need to f- f- have some way of defining who who is suffering from this disorder. And by looking at those questionnaires, you get a, a good idea of what at least those researchers what they felt was their definition of these emotions. And they were these are questionnaires that they were gave to hundreds or thousands of people to validate. And, you know, uh, come up with uh, the, the ratings of uh, what's high and what's low, what's, what's, what's typical. And by taking them yourself, you, you learn about yourself, which is good. And you also um, get, get a, I felt a more personal connection to the material that I was giving. So that, that chapter was there for that reason. And then the regulation chapter is, even though the whole book is about how emotion, well, much of the book is about how emotion is a state of uh, a functional state, as Ralph would say, that that affects your what you think is your rational processing. That you get different answers when your brain analyzes data depending on the emotional state that you're in. So I go into that a lot. But um, sometimes that emotion gets out of control. Some people have a problem with too much anger, or or um, sometimes the anger persists, and, and you or, or whatever emotion it is, because that's one of the qualities of an emotion is that it doesn't just come and go right away. It, it, it has some persistence. And so how do you handle that? Uh, for example, just a quick example. I, I told the story of I was driving in downtown LA trying to get to a meeting. It was not a meeting I really wanted to be. I had to be there. It was going to be kind of boring. But anyway, 
I'm, I'm trying to get there on time and I'm only a block away. And I hit to hit some construction and I got to take a detour and the detour is not marked very well. And I get lost and I get stuck in the one way streets and I'm like 20 minutes late and I'm angry at the city because can't they just put some arrow signs to, to get you around all this construction and that you can just follow. And then I realized, you know, I'm getting why I'm getting all puffed up, but Actually, I'm happy to miss the first 20 minutes of the meeting and have a good excuse to miss it because I don't want to be there anyway. And it is a good excuse. It's not just the usual L.A. excuse that everyone gives because of traffic, because everyone there knew that this construction was going on. So it was a believable excuse. (laughs) And it was true. And so I started thinking, oh, uh, I reappraised, right, the situation. This is called reappraisal. I I was happy now because no one's going to get mad at me and I get to miss the beginning of the meeting. Uh, and tra la la, that's that's good. And so this one method of handling your emotions, which is called reappraisal, or let's say spin doctoring, and, and by by that I don't mean picking a, 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 a you know picking a story that that you don't believe in, it's picking an alternate story that you do believe in, and focusing on that, and that can change your your emotional experience. Like if someone cuts you off in the freeway, you could think what an ass and get angry at the person. Or you could think, oh, that, that poor person is probably late for a meeting <laughs> or has to get home or something, or is just right. oblivious to the world and didn't do it out of any kind of disrespect or, or being an ass, but just did it because they're not paying attention and maybe I'm not that angry anymore. So I, I started, so, so these are examples of how you can regulate your emotion. And I, I thought that, and there are a lot of, well, what's interesting is some of the experiments on them and there, we don't think we have time for it, but there's uh some pretty sexy experiments they've done on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, in the laboratory, giving electric shocks to their subjects and seeing which, which emotion regulation method you know, works better when they're trying to you know, continue, continue to face stronger shocks and, and so forth. So I, I thought those chapters, they are a bit um, self-helpy, although I try not to, I don't come from that point of view. I come from the scientific point of view, but I thought they were really, they added a lot to the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think so. And I think that's why we write books. That's why scientists ultimately write books for the public. It's to open up science and um, democratize it and make it more accessible to people so that they can actually use it. Um, What you're calling reappraisal, what James Gross calls reappraisal is very similar. It's actually identical to the notion of categorizing. That is to create a category, to say this, um, I'm going to make meaning of this set of events in a, in a different way. And that's a, actually a really powerful skill that, that a human brain, actually that any brain has, but that a human brain has in, you know, in, in spades, actually. It's very, very powerful capacity of the human brain. Um, so I had so many other questions that I wanted to ask you about, um, but we, we only have a few minutes left. And in those, these last few minutes, I wanted to ask you um, about the, one of the um, stories that you tell in the book um, about your mom at the end of the book uh, in the epilogue. It's a, it's a story, um, that story brought me to tears actually, I have to tell you. And um, it starts off with you talking about how you would visit your mom. This is pre COVID. You'd visit your mother every, you know, once or twice a week and you'd have a chocolate milkshake with her. And I actually laughed out loud when I read that. I was thinking, I, I, my, I hope my daughter does that with me. Like that's a, that's a thing you should do with your mother is have a chocolate milkshake once a week. I, <laughs> I just thought that was lovely. Um, um, but then it goes on to talk about, you know, her, her illness and her death. And I'm wondering, um, how it felt to write about that and how it feels to be asked about it in interviews like this one. Well, it's uh, still emotional for me and I uh, have to, you know, take a breath and uh, exercise my emotion regulation so I don't lose it. You know, I was pretty close with my mother and, um, it was uh, awful. I mean, the whole thing was awful. And um, the way she died, uh, because she died, she got COVID. 
And uh, then at the end, we couldn't, we're not allowed to see her. And uh, at first she was in her assisted living home and we could at least walk up to a window and be outside and, you know, wave at her, blow kisses or something when she's inside. Um, but so at the end, what the, the story at the end had to do with a phone call I got from her doctor <clears throat> about uh, whether to leave her in, in her assisted living or take her to the hospital. And she hated the hospital. It was, it was uh, like torture for her. She had a tendency toward pneumonias. And so she had been hospitalized over the years several times for pneumonia. And she just didn't do well and didn't. And, and I would have to sit here with her all day and uh, sometimes cradle her. And I mean, it was hard to breathe. She didn't like the oxygen up. And she just was like, didn't like the hospital. And so the doctor said, if we leave her here, she'll be dead soon. And, but she has a chance to survive if we send her to the hospital. And what do you want to do? And this is crazy, but, oh, by the way, I need to know now. I was, I I forget, five to six. Or since she said six, I leave. I'm going to the hospital, start making rounds. It won't be reachable. And the, the, the home needs a decision. Are you going to, do they call an ambulance or do they leave her here? So I, I, I said, um, well, I, I got five minutes. Let me think for four minutes and call you back, <laughs> you know? And, um, and she said, okay, but after six, I won't be answering. So you got to call back, you know, before six. And so I hung up and, um, how do you make a decision like that? Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, it's, I don't know. Anyway, I made a decision and, of course, there were, see, this is a good point of saying that there's no single emotional feeling. How do you categorize the emotion that you feel as you're making that decision? It's a mixture of love, fear, fear, anxiety, <laughs> guilt. I don't know. Uh, or all these different functional states are, if I'm ha- engaging in any logical processing at all, it, it's, it's all, you know, your uh, emotions change your goals, the way your sensory input is treated your memories that are, you know, and how skeptical you are of information and how much you weight you give to things. All this stuff is a big hodgepodge in my head. And I came up with the decision um, to keep her at, at the home. So I call the, uh, I call uh, the doctor back and she says, well, what's your decision? And uh, actually I think I wasn't even sure what I was going to say. Um, see, it's been a while now, but yeah. It, uh <clears throat> But I, but I, at then on the phone, I decide I'm going to say, keep her at the home. I just figured I had to make a game time decision. And I start to say, start to say that. And it turns out that I say the opposite. And I say, take her to the hospital. And so I'm, I talk in the book about how that all happened. And I relate it to another story of my father and when he was in the resistance, which I can't really go into now. But um, so I talk about how on, on an unconscious level, uh, there's all these uh, processes going on and something called core affect, which uh, we didn't talk about. And, and your, your intuition, your gut feelings are so intertwined with, with your emotions and your, your, and your feelings that, that um, sometimes you just have to let it out and your unconscious knows what's best for you or makes this some complex decision-making uh, your unconscious is often better than, than your conscious reasoning, than your A to B to C logic. And I just let, I just let my heart speak, and I told the doctor to um, take her to the hospital. And it seemed to be a good decision because she wasn't uh, wasn't suffering. And I would at least uh, for the in the beginning, I was able to talk to her over the iPhone, and, and the nurses would be very good about you know letting it, holding it up for her. And she seemed to be getting better. Um, and then at the end, she just suddenly took a turn for the worse and died very suddenly. And I got a call at three in the morning that she that she had had died, but I I didn't regret that decision to give her a chance at life. I think I would have regretted it had I not given her that chance. Thank you for sharing that. I can't even imagine what that must have been like. Um, And thank you for this conversation. Um, And thank you for the book and good luck with it. Well, 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 thanks Lisa. And, and, uh, I've, I've enjoyed it. I always enjoy talking to you and uh, hopefully we'll intersect in some city soon and uh, have a uh, face to face. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts.